that's the beauty of sport is that tomorrow's a new day. And honestly, that, like just because somebody's better than you at 10 or 11 or even in pro, like yeah. you, you can pass guys if, if you have the right mindset and if you have the right determination kind of thing. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Just watch me now. Hey there, welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan. I am Jason Podolan, and today my guest on the Up My Hockey podcast is Kevin Peterson. Kevin Peterson is the current Western scout of the Arizona Coyotes, uh, where he is responsible for the WHL, the BCHL, and the AJHL. Uh, these are all amateur leagues that are really feeder systems to either the, the Division I U.S. Uh, universities or also the, uh, you know, the NHL and the AHL and the, and the, and the pro leagues. So... He has, a, he has a lot of uh, ground to cover there, and he's watching games all the time. Uh, he's, in, he's in the room for the conversations at draft time about what, uh, where these big decisions get made and who gets drafted and how the rankings work and, and what they're actually looking for. So his insight there for, for those of you who either want to be able to be scouted or want to know what scouts you're looking for, if you're a parent that wants to understand how do I position my kid or how do I get somebody in the, you know, in the right set of circumstances for them to succeed, Kevin is a... Kevin is a great one to listen to here on this episode. Um, he has a great history within the game. He's responsible for BC Hockey U16 program, where he's the lead evaluator and the head scout. Uh, this is uh, a thing that happens every spring, every summer, where he puts together the top U16 players in BC to represent BC uh, at a tournament later on. He's been doing that for years now. He's also been involved in the BRIC program for British Columbia, which is the best nine-year-olds in BC, where they put together a team, and he's the co-head coach of that team. So he's seen guys come through the system. He's coached the Matt Barzells um, of the world and seen them at nine years old and go through the ranks and then become the NHL stars they are today. He's also seen guys who have been great uh, amateur athletes that haven't gone on. So, you know, he's... He offers some insight of what maybe makes that guy get to the next level to make them allow them to have these pro careers. Um, and he's also been a coach, so he understands what it's like to work with players one-on-one. -on -one. He understands what it's like um, to have questions asked from scouts about players. So some really great insights on that level when, when he was assistant coach with the Vernon Vipers of the BCHL. So um, lots of good stuff here. Lots of, lots of really interesting insights from from a side of the game that doesn't get heard too much about, which is the scouting side and the coaching side, and how that can apply to making you the best player you want to be. So, without further ado, um, I give you the interview with Kevin Peterson. Thank you. So, Kev, yeah, awesome. Thanks for joining. Yeah, uh, this is super cool to have you here. Uh, it's great that you're in the same community and just all over and come over to my little makeshift uh, studio here. Yeah. Um, just getting a little bit of background about you. Um, Obviously, you've been hockey essentially your whole life. I know you well enough to know that. I mean, there's been hockey's been running through your veins. Um, why don't we start off just as a player? I mean, that's the way we all kind of get attracted to this game. Starting is, uh, is putting the skates on and trying to score some goals ourselves. Where did your personal career take you? Um, I, I actually started uh, skating lessons when I was about six, and I cried on the ice, and I didn't like it. My parents took me out of it, and uh, when I was about eight, I had to convince them that I was ready to try it again. Um, I was awful when I started. I remember my first year in novice, I didn't have a goal. I don't even think I touched a puck. And uh, when I was nine, going into my next year in novice, I, for whatever reason, switched to D and I had some success. So it was uh, a little bit more fun. Um, growing up, I was sort of uh, like a smart player, so I understood the game. I had an advantage over some other kids that just had the skills. Um, from there, I kind of just played, you know, Port Coquitlam minor hockey and just worked my way up. Um, I was never the best guy. I was just one of the smartest players. I never really had the courage to play. Um, I, I didn't play hard enough at that time. Um, I played some junior B and um, I got in one junior A game and, um, you know, I started I started falling in love with the, with the coaching aspect. I watched my coaches in junior and just had a respect level for what they were teaching us and how hard it was to run a practice and organize a schedule and when I was 19, I got a job teaching uh, skating lessons in Port Moody. And from there, I just uh, transitioned into coaching, got my levels, and, you know, here we are. So it was, uh, yeah, it was. A, it, I, I have I have very limited playing experience, you know, in terms of what you guys have. But everything that I didn't get uh, in terms of the player, I thought I made up for it, you know, as a coach and, and learning the game that way. So. Oh, that's cool. I think that's invaluable, too. I mean, guys like Ken Hitchcock and there are some guys that are, you know, 
the best of the best that have never that have never technically played. Right. Um, but the fact that you have some experience at a, at a, at a pretty high level, I think that still it, it allows you to have, I would think, um, a little more understanding, a little more respect for what those guys are doing on the ice. Do you think that holds true? Uh, I do, and I think. Um, like I was, I was healthy scratch a lot and I, I didn't play a lot in junior and, and, you know, I didn't have the personality where it bothered me. I just wanted to be around the guys. Um, that was, that was the attract attraction for me to play junior was, I'm sure you say the same thing about pro is the dressing room, the guys, you know, the bus just hanging out. So, um, when, when I was coaching and, and guys were getting scratched, I felt like I could, I could help them on, on that, you know, cause sometimes you can beat yourself up, get yourself down. Um, I just, I always had a personality that, that I just loved being at the rink, whether I was playing or not. I loved just, just if I was healthy scratch, I loved watching the game. And I, I thought I had a good personality for that. Maybe my coaches kept scratching me because they knew it didn't bother me. But um, yeah, like, honestly, I think that, um, you know, like some perspective of playing did help me. But I think the biggest thing that helped me was just my love for the game and, and how I could try and as a coach, put that into the next kid that I was coaching. Yeah, two interesting things that I thought of when you're saying that. One is that aspect of the healthy scratch. Um, I was there in the NHL. That was, I think, that was the only time in my life I was healthy scratch in the NHL. And uh, and you see different personalities handle that differently. And what I thought was interesting in that scenario, seeing that happen two different personalities, one on the player side, right? So like that side of the personality is going to handle differently, but two, the coaches want to see different things. I think sometimes from those guys, Yeah. Right? some coaches want to see a guy pissed off and throwing stuff in the room. Some guys want to see a guy that's going to show up early the next day. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think there's a little bit of a test with that too. You know, I think like looking back on our pause, I think that I kept getting scratched because I don't think I reacted. I think the coaches were just like, Oh, this guy loves it. He's up there in the stands taking stats. He's, I, I, this is true. I, I would after the game as a scratch, I'd go in the coach's office and I would I would talk about the game, win or lose. And um, you know, looking back on it now, I can see how that was an issue. But at the time, I was just I was basically acting as an, as an extension of the coaches or as a scout. You know, I was an 18 year old kid getting scratched in junior, and I was up in the stands, you know, running down plays. Uh, you know, this player, you know, didn't pass it here. I felt like he had an option on the power play, so. I was like becoming a coach before their eyes. And now when I look back, I thought, well, now when I think it's like from their perspective, they're probably looking at it going, man, we scratched this guy 10 games in a row. Like, is he ever going to tell us he wants to play or is he comfortable just with the notepad? So at the time I was like, oh, these guys love me. I'm, I'm taking great notes. But now looking back, you know what? I probably should have reacted more like, but that just, that's just a testament of me as a player. That that was what was in me. It, you couldn't force me to, hey, Kev, go get in a fight in practice, prove you want to play. I was comfortable just in the stands watching. So, um, you know, maybe I didn't have, like, the, the mindset to, to do that, but I, I just did what, what was comfortable for me, right? So sure. No, I think that's interesting because we can't – when I talk to the players now, it's like forcing yourself to do something that, that's not you yeah. um, is – is challenging for sure, right? I'm not even sure if it's necessary, but there is that interpersonal relationship part of it where you do have three guys, and now some of the NHL, there's five, six, seven guys that are kind of responsible for your ice time. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting trying to manage that those relationships, right? Because sure. you know you can't be so stoic and stuck in your own skin. That's like this is the way I do things, and right. damn it, these guys are going to have to like me, right? I think there is a little bit of flexibility that we have to have, yeah, and maybe come out of our comfort zones a little bit, but. Uh, Anyway, so that's a whole other thing. Why don't we get into your coaching? Because like that's where, that's where obviously your your heart and soul lie for a while. I know now you're in the scouting component, but uh, like where did where did your first job come from as, as a coach? Yeah, crazy. Um, yeah, I, I made a joke not too long ago. I should go back to my old high school and tell some kids in class like you know you, you can actually make it when you when you never thought you could because. Uh, I was probably, you know, in my early 20s and I was uh, teaching the skating lessons, like I said, in Port Moody. And I had a couple hockey school jobs and, you know, I can plug them. One of them was called Puck Masters and one of them was called RPM Hockey Schools. And, you know, as a, as a young kid, it's just another outlet to be on the ice. Like, I, I never thought, Jason, I never thought, I mean, let's be honest, I never thought I'd make the NHL. It was always a dream, but I never thought I would make it. I, I had one game junior experience. I was always 
fighting the fight, you know, in terms of trying to get jobs. I didn't have that resume. And I started working hockey schools because it was just better than working nine to fives. And it was and it was a cool way just to be on the ice with kids. And, you know, like if, if you're in your if you're in your early 20s and you need money, how, how is that not awesome to go on the ice with kids and work a hockey school? Um, I met a guy in the hockey school. Uh, I met two people. The first guy I'm going to say his name was Travis Doe. And he gave me a job assistant coach at Hollyburn Country Club. And uh, I knew nothing about coaching. I just, you know, was a young kid that wanted to learn. Travis was the head coach. And on our team, we had a player that everybody knows, Sam Reinhardt. And uh, that was my first assistant coaching job. So I kind of learned on the fly from Travis. I learned um, sitting down with Paul Reinhardt. And he's telling me some drills and just, you know, what to do. And trial by fire. My first year was touch and go. I didn't know... Um, you know, I had some good drills. I had some good teaching techniques, but I didn't know sort of bench management. I didn't know how to push players. It was a really good environment for me, Hollyburn Country Club. Just it was uh, the pressure wasn't there to, you know, go forty and zero. There was there was um, what level was that? It was Pee Wee Triple A, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, they helped me. the The expectations was that you know they knew I was a young assistant coach, but they wanted to help me get better. From there. Was that, that was a volunteer position? Yeah, that was a volunteer position. And then from there, Travis, the, the same guy I mentioned, Travis, he went to uh, Burning Winter Club the next year to coach uh, Adam A1. Yeah. And uh, he asked me if I would go with him. So, you know, here I am, you know, BWC growing up as a kid, that was like a name, right? That was... That BWC, was, just for those of you who know, Burning <laughs> Winter Club, which is a pretty um, established and respected yeah, organization. Yeah, so. for sure. And that was like, you know, that was cool for me because it was a name. It was like I was I was going to coach at... A, a legitimate, you know, winter club. And for me as a, as a, as a young kid, I, I thought, oh, I made it. You know what I mean? Like, this is it. So Travis and I went to coach an Adam AAA team there, and we had a kid on the team that people should know, Dante Fabro. So um, that was two years in a row of me coaching special players, and that just put a shot in my arm like, wow, these kids are amazing, and if I can have any impact in their lives as, right. as human beings or players – I think I matured a little bit, you know, those two years, just seeing the talent those kids had and, and putting pressure on myself to help them. Um, and then I stayed at Burning Winter Club for two more years. Um, and then my best friend today, uh, Leland Mack, he coaches at Burning Winter Club still. We went to uh, Major Midget together, BC Major Midget League, yeah. and um, I coached there for a couple of years. Um, I was with him. Yeah, that was with Leland, yeah. And then uh, I went to North Shore Winter Club, so I got my feet wet at all the winter clubs. But I went to North Shore Winter Club to coach uh, Bantam AAA, assistant coach. Uh, we had two really good teams. Um, and then from there, Mark Ferner called me and asked if I wanted to come up here. Um, I had previously scouted for Mark uh, in, in Vernon and in Everett. So we had an existing relationship. And, uh, yeah, Mark called me in 2013, 14, 15, I guess. I can't remember. It was probably 2014, and um, yeah, he asked if I wanted to come up here. So, cool. um, you know, I took a chance. Like, you know, uh, Duncan, you know, who's not with us anymore, he gave me a chance to. Um, Duncan Ray was the owner, and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. But he gave me a chance to cut my teeth up here in the BC Hockey League, yeah. and I, you know, I owe him and his family, you know, greatly, and Mark as well for giving me that chance. But. Yeah, started uh, started in uh, Pee Wee Hockey and made it this far. So well, that's super great, I, and I think that's interesting because I mean, it sounds even in your story that there's a lot of relationship relationship based uh, associations there, right? Even your first chance there at uh, at the Pee Wee level was a guy that you knew that invited you to come on board, yeah, and then you fo- you followed him to the, the next spot, right? exactly. Um, how do you? That's one thing I didn't necessarily understand, I don't think, and I think that's for anyone listening here, like especially the young, inspiring people, is like the hockey world is such a, it's such a tight spot, it's such a tight place, and uh, and there is a lot of uh, advantages and opportunities that can be had with, with relationships, and it's not, it's not trying to manufacture relationships, it's just understanding that it's a people business, Yeah. right? Do you agree with that? I do, and there's a lot of people... Um, no matter what you do in life, if you're successful, you've you've had help along the way. That's that's the nature of the business. Like I, I mean, I know there are some people that that do it alone, but that's that's very tough. And hockey, you're right; it's a very um, tight knit community. And there's the old saying, "Hit your wagon to somebody." I, I never, I just wanted to be loyal. If if somebody took a chance on me, 
um, and, and wanted to hire me, I, I wanted to be loyal to that person who took a chance on me. And, and there was a, a really influential, uh, two influential people in, in Vancouver. One was um, a guy by the name of Matt Earhart. He coached uh, Sir Eagle in the BC Hockey League. He, he took a chance on me in spring hockey to help him coach, and, and I learned so much from him. And the other guy would be uh, John Calvano. He took a chance on me to to help him with with minor hockey brick stuff and yeah. and uh, yeah I just want, I wanted to be loyal to those people the same same way I came here with Mark like he gave me a chance so cool. you know it's uh, I think it just shows value if someone if someone is loyal because um, then then you know if, if that person believes in you then that hey you bring me where you want want to go and I'll go with you you know uh, it's not so much to be a follower it's just you know look I'll, I'll be loyal to you if we can kind of trust each other if that makes sense. So. I think it does totally. I think that's, I think that's how careers get made. Yeah. I mean, especially in the coaching world, because you see guys go to teams and they usually have their nucleus of guys that they want with them. And it's not because obviously they're going to bring people who are skilled and talented at what they do. I mean, that's the thing that at that level, there's a lot of guys that know what's going on, but the question is, is that trust there? Yeah. Right. Because you can interview for a spot, but if you have no history, if you don't know what the, you know, the, the guys make up and they're going to bring them into your organization into that inner circle, it's right. like, geez, you need to have that trust. And I think that's why kind of the same groups sort of go to the same jobs like around the same person is what I mean by that. Yeah, you, you see in the NHL when, uh, when, you know, when Coach X gets hired in a new team, he, he usually brings his, his closest staff with him from previous or, yeah. you know, maybe they worked together in junior or something. So yeah, I think everybody works better with people around they trust and respect. So. Yeah. You know, I, I can work with anybody. I feel, but I work best. I work best when when I'm with people that that trust me and you know we're loyal together. So. Even those names that you mentioned there, um, I, I think a lot of people are wondering, well, how do you? you know, I don't know anybody. Right. I don't know anybody. I want to get ahead. Whether you're a player that wants to get ahead and feels like you know they don't they don't have those connections or the parents aren't wired in with the right people or there's people maybe want to scout or coach like you do. I was like, well, how do I do this? Do you have any advice there? Like, for how do you how do you start making these connections? How did you do it? You know what? Uh, my story is my story is like a rags to riches. To be fair, I, I used to just stick myself in the ring. I used to just like you know we talked about Burn Winter Club before. That was uh, you know we're going back 10, 12 years. That that place was the place in Vancouver to be. So if you were a young aspiring hockey coach, that's where you went. You know now. Now the landscape has changed with the academies and stuff. But my advice to people and the way I did it was I just went, I just stuck myself in the rink. If there was a practice, um, I would ask the coach, hey, can I push pucks for you? And, and nine times out of ten, they would say no because they didn't know me. You know, the Bantam A team was practicing, hey, you know, can I push pucks? No. Okay, well, that means I'll just watch. And if you're at 20 practices in a row watching and every time they look up and think, like, who is this guy? And you keep asking, can I push pucks? Then finally they say yes. And that might lead to, you know, can I shadow you on the bench one game? Or I think honestly, the, like, doesn't matter what you do. If if you if you if you if you have passion for what you're doing, then you'll find a way, and and the connections will be made. Um, I made mine naturally. I made mine just um, volunteering. I think volunteering is a lost art form. I do. Like I think, and and no disrespect to anybody listening, but I think the volunteer. Um, you know, people aren't as willing to volunteer anymore than they were, you know, going back to when I was younger, when you were young, it's, it's now it's, you know, I want to get paid. I, I want, you know, compensation. I want this. I mean, the first four years I coached, I did it for free. Yeah. And, and I don't, I mean, putting myself in the people's shoes that hired me, they're thinking like, man, this guy works harder than anybody else. And he's not getting paid yeah. like that. That bumps you up a little bit. Right. Yeah. And every time I went to the rink, I wasn't getting paid. I was doing my own dime. And, and I felt like that was valuable for me. So, so advice for people is show commitment, but show passion for what you're doing. And don't always, I didn't try and jump 10 levels. I just, I did it slowly. And I remember going to a coaches conference and Pat Quinn saying, master the level you're at before you go to the next level. And I just always took that advice. Like I'm, I'm going to master this, this level. I'm going to make meet as many people as I can. I'm going to volunteer as much time, prove that I'm doing it for the right reasons. And then, Maybe I'll meet the next guy. So that's the way I did. Yeah, that's perfect. I think that's uh, there's a valuable lesson in that for players too. I think uh, uh, sometimes we get caught in like what 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 we think maybe our expectation is or what it's supposed to be. And and if you want to be a player and if you want to get to that next level, like you said like being around the rank is like is not a bad habit right. to have. You know what I mean? And, 
if you can get your routines and your preparation sequence around that, like that's one thing I say because it is your image is your image. Right. You know what I mean? And, and whether that's right or wrong, people are going to look at you, what you're doing and how you're acting, what your actions are, and they're going to make a judgment. Right. That's just human species, right? right? So if you're a kid, guys, and you're around the rink and you're a guy that comes two hours before practice and you're taping your stick and you're doing whatever it is and you're after the game and you're asking questions, like the coaches around you think that you give a shit. Yeah. That's a big deal. No, it is. I mean, you might really care, but you just think you're a guy, oh, I'm not that guy that comes early. Try and mold your preparation sequence around that because yeah. you're just going to be looked on in a way better way. Honestly, um, it's one of those things where I can honestly admit that I didn't have that in school. I didn't have that as a player, but I picked up that passion as a scout and a coach. And sometimes your passion finds you. Sometimes you find it, you know, whether you write music or want to fly planes or whatever it is, whatever your passion is, like I said, sometimes you find it, sometimes it finds you. I, I wasn't early for school. I didn't study I, as a player. I loved being early, but that was just to talk to my buddies. Like I didn't go early because I wanted to prepare. I just went early to socialize. Um, I didn't. I didn't get in the gym as much as the other guys. You know, I, I would go, but I would socialize. Yeah. But then, as a coach and I, as a scout, I did exactly what you what you mentioned. I, I put myself in the ring for 10, 12, 14 hours a day, and yeah. that was the passion I gained for for coaching and scouting. And like you said, it's a. If you're always looking around and seeing somebody in the stands, you either think this guy's crazy or he, or he's absolutely in love with what he's doing, and that and that was me. And anybody that knows me from when I started, they just know me from from being in the ring. So no, that's great. Uh, I was always a guy that just thought, and I, I really had a chip on my shoulder that way. Like I just thought, what you do on the ice is all that matters, right? If you put up the points, you put up the goals, you put up the assists, and I was just like, I just wanted to hang my hat on that for whatever reason, right? right. And then. But because of that, I, I got I got shifted from the fact of like it does matter what sort of how you're representing yourself else, elsewhere. You know, right. I, I felt like it was a hard work away from the rink. But I would I'd be a guy that would do push ups like so no one could see me. Right. Right. I wasn't the guy that was doing it in front of the coach's office. I really I just looked down my nose on guys that did that. I'm like, oh, you know, brown nose or whatever the heck I thought that was. But right. the reality of the situation is. You're still making an impression on people, right? Yeah. Like you, sure, you want to have results on the ice, and that's really, I mean, especially at the level that you're at now, I mean, the results, you need to have wins. You need, right. you need to do things. You need to score goals, right? It's a results-based business. I get that. But to get the opportunities that we want sometimes, sometimes we have to do things that maybe make us uncomfortable. Like for me, like getting in front of some people and, and showing them that you care, right? right? Instead of hiding in the corner and knowing that you care, right? Yeah. It's sort of an interesting uh, take on it. I know, not, I know there are some guys that are wired like me. The other guys that are wired more like they want to be there. They want to be in front of the coaches doing their thing, right? But I yeah. think we have to understand that it is a human people business, right? right? And people need to like you. Right. That's the end of the deal, right? People need to like you. For you to get an opportunity for Mark Fern to pick up the phone, yeah. he has to like you. Right. Yeah. He, there's lots of guys you could have picked up the phone for, but right. for whatever reason you picked up the phone and called you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And there was an opportunity that you had, that you had made in the years before, and I think that's interesting. Um, which is, maybe we should get into the next one, which is the brick. You mentioned the brick earlier. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting uh, scenario for me. For, for Maybe you want to tell people what the brick is, because not everyone's necessarily familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, and, and growing up, I didn't know either. And I, and I, like I said, the, the name that I mentioned before, John Calvano, he, he, um, him and Steve Bradford, they, they were the ones that um, got the brick. Steve Bradford was the one that got the brick started from, from BC. His son was a 1987-born uh, player called Brock Bradford, went to Boston College. Um, the Brick is a tournament in uh, in West Edmonton Mall every Canada Day week, and it's for the best ten year olds in North America. And um, the first time I went, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I had been to West Edmonton Mall before, but never for a hockey tournament. And after the first time I went, I've been hooked, and it's been ten years. So we just finished uh, this July. We didn't have a great year, but we have won it in the past. Um, but yeah, the Brick is a uh, it's an amazing. Uh, week of hockey it's monday to sunday and um, it's teams like detroit junior red wings chicago junior blackhawks um, we're the vancouver junior canucks there's a team called team brick alberta winnipeg junior jets and um, what it is is it's like i said it's the best 10 year olds in north america playing in a mall in the middle of summer and it's uh you know i get excited talking about it because every year that i've been there's been the next um, you know, the next NHL or is in that tournament. And I know it's it's hyperbole to say that, that the next NHL or is coming from that tournament, but but it the results have shown. If we look up the history of the tournament, you know, this, the, 
Jordan Everly played for Vancouver. Seth Jones played for Vancouver. Matthew Barzell played for Vancouver. Obviously, Dante Fabre we talked about. And and for me, that tournament means a lot more than just the hockey. For me, the tournament is, um, you know, my boss in, in Arizona, Lindsey Hoffer, um, I met him at the Brick Tournament. So that tournament means a lot more to me than just 10-year-old hockey. That, that tournament holds a special place in my heart, and I'm so thankful to go every year. It's a, it's an opportunity that, that many players and coaches don't get. And I'm we know in your garage. What is your role with the Brick? Yeah, so um, John is the, the, the owner of the program. He runs the Junior Canucks, and um, uh, he hires me. Um, each year to help him coach the team. So so we do a tryout process throughout the season. We do a summer tryout, a winter tryout, and kids from all over the province. We have we we we've had players from Vernon. We've had players from Kelowna. We've had players from Prince George, the island. Um, they do tryout process with us, and and John and I essentially coach a team together. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean it, it's a great relationship we have. He's kind of like the hard nose guy and I'm kind of like the, you know, pick him up guy and it's a good balance. But um, yeah, we've been going together for 10 years and we've, we've won it once together. We lost in the finals a couple of times together, but uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, I have so much fun with it. And I just, I just have a lot of passion for the tournament. Like I said, I met, I met my future boss at the tournament. So it, it, holds, oh, a special, it holds a special place in my heart for sure. And it's, um, it's essentially the show, right? For 10 year olds. I mean, like there's people, there's people that come to watch, like it's well attended. Um, yeah. you know, they treat them like, they treat them like rock stars there, all, all the, all the swag they get and stuff. So for yeah. these 10 year olds that are going, uh, I never attended, but I, I've definitely seen pictures. I've watched the videos. I've talked to guys who have been there and it seems like it's a pretty cool place. Which is interesting too, because now we can get into a little bit of like crazy hockey parents and uh, and the fact of like there's a lot that can happen from the time you're 10 years old to the time you're drafted at 18. I mean, most 10 year olds haven't gone touched puberty yet. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of things that are going on there, and I'm sure, like you said, you've mentioned some names now, but there are guys that are, I'm sure, great in that tournament that go on to be great. Yeah. And I'm sure there's guys that are great in that tournament that go on to do nothing. Right, and I'm sure those guys that maybe don't even make that team that obviously go on to to right. be any showers, right? Yeah. So, um, I think that's probably interesting for you to see, right? To watch to watch who maybe does go on, who doesn't. Do you ever see any? Like, is there any guys that you just thought were just can't miss, and you're like, oh, geez, what happened to them? Or hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I'm not, not going to name names. That's that's disrespectful. But yeah. I think like um, you know the success stories. You know, it's easier to point those out. Yeah. And and like I mentioned before, my boss Lindsay, he's. You know, he, he coaches the Toronto team, and, you know, we're talking about, like, his 1990 team had Petrangelo, Subban, and um, um, Steven Stamkos on it. So, I mean, like, we can talk about those guys, but I'm sure on that team as well, he had other players that he thought were at that caliber. And yeah. it's the same it's the same for the Vancouver guys. You know, we, we've had the Matthew Barzells, and we've had those guys, but there are other players that we've had that were at that level that just – you know, for whatever reason, maybe they peaked early or maybe, um, you know, we talked about earlier the passion level. Maybe they didn't put the time in. And yeah. there's a lot of circumstances that, that go into to making it, you know, at the highest level. And, you know, the, the 0.1% or whatever it is that make the NHL, um, I, I always say to people, if, if you're on a brick team, you got a good chance of playing junior hockey. I'm not saying NHL, but I'm saying most of the times, the 10 years I've been, it's 75% of our team ends up at Junior A or Western Hockey League. So they're still getting to that level. But I do agree with you, Jason, that, that there are there has been some guys in the past where, you know, you're thinking, man, this guy is like a no-brainer. And for whatever reason, his development might have stalled or, um, you know, sometimes it can be away from the rink too, you know, personal life, uh, home life. You know, I, I don't ever – pretend to know why some kids don't make it. But, yeah, you're, you hit the nail on the head. For every Matthew Barzell, there has been, you know, one example where, you know, he thought a guy was going to make it and he ultimately didn't. But um, I think I like looking at the other side of the coin, too, is because I know, like my son, I mean, what's interesting to me about the brick is that I have two kids. Well, one just passed the brick age. Yeah. The other one's coming out. Uh, my oldest is like super keen, right? He's yeah. super keen, and so he sees these guys like Ollie Reed and yeah. you know, some of these guys that made the team, and goes to school with them, and and has these kids on a pedestal, and, and almost feels I don't know what the right word is. He'd have to say it, but like I'm going to say the word inferior, right? It's yeah. not. It, this is not. I think it's interesting for kids to know. Of course, you want to aspire to be in your top bracket, and you want to be as good as these other kids. But yeah. there's so much that can happen if you just stay working hard and you just stay. 
you know, focused on your game, that it's not means that you're, you know, no. the, the world, the world can't open up for you. No, right? and I think honestly, like the best way I can put it is, is just because you're the best at nine or 10 doesn't mean you're going to be the best at 11, 12, 13. It's, it's it takes a special player to be the best at every age until he's in the NHL. That, that is, that's the 1%. That's like, that's the guys that we've mentioned on camera. The, you know, the players that you, your son's the same age, yeah, that player might be better today, but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or a month or a year from now. And I don't I don't wish any, um, you know, negative on, on kids, but I have seen it before where at 10, you're the best player in your city or your town in Vernon or Kelowna, and the next time I see you when you're 14 or 15 trying out for, you know, under 16, you've either regressed or you've stalled or kids have passed you. So that's the beauty of sport is that tomorrow is a new day. And honestly, that, like just because somebody's better than you at 10 or 11 or even in pro, like yeah. you, you can pass guys if, if you have the right mindset and if you have the right determination kind of thing. Yeah, I agree yeah no. And we've seen it already. Like, for, again, my son is the example. Like barely made the C team last year. Like – Puts his nose to the grindstone, works, 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 gets MVP votes by the end of the year. Yeah. Right? And now he's on the A team and really doing doing well there, right? Yeah. So it's a, I think it is a mindset thing, right? And it, and it gets back to the passion, whether you mean something you want to do. And I just think kids need to know that there is a lot that you can do outside of the of the four walls of the arena, right? right. In those corners, right? right? Yeah. Um, whether it's shooting pucks, whatever it is that you enjoy about the game, there's ways to get better at it, right? right. Um, outside of that. In this day and age, too, with, I mean, the stuff that we're doing right now, you know, like listening to a podcast or throwing on some YouTube videos of what's going on out there. There's so many ways to feed your, to feed the game if you want to, if you want to close the gap. I agree. Um, so the Bricks, we covered that. Hockey BC, can we talk about Hockey BC? I know that you've been involved with that quite a bit. I think it's the under 16 or uh, yeah. best ever program, I believe. And what's that all about? Um, I'll kind of go into my history a little bit. I was, I was trying to find ways when I was younger, what we talked about earlier, learning to coach and, I was trying to find ways to network and be involved. And as a player, I never played in. It used to be called BC Best Ever. And as a player, I never, I was never good enough to play in it. Um, so I always held it on this pedestal, like, oh, my God, you know, BC Best Ever, you know, under 16, under 17. This is, like, the program, right? And uh, I contacted the guy who ran the program, um, the evaluation side. His name was Mitch Pinsky, you know, probably 10, 11, 12 years ago now. And uh, – um, I asked him, hey, can I volunteer uh, in the program? So to give you a history of where I started, there used to be a, a role called a group leader, and we used to do the tryouts over a weekend in Langley at a school. So we do, we do it in Langley at a, at a high school, and the, the top kids from the province would be invited to try out, and we would stay um, at, at the school for Friday, Saturday, Sunday during the tryouts, and the group leader's job was to get the kids to the rink on time to fill the water, you know, just yeah. all the stuff that you don't want to do. Right. And then you sleep in the gym, you know, like all the, everybody sleeping in the gym and, and you're in there too. So, you know, you bring your air mattress and you get two hours of sleep because it's loud in there yeah. and did that for three years. And uh, I did it with the 91s and 92s and 93s. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Colton Sissons, uh, like some guys that, you know, Ryan Johansson, guys that are playing the NHL now. So I was the one carting them back and forth from the rink, and you know, just a young kid, just just happy to be there. And then the fourth year in the program, I got to be an uh, evaluator. So I thought, well, this is it, I made it, right? So then my fifth year, I got to be a coach in the program. So um, now my job is I'm the lead evaluator, essentially the head scout for the under 16s. So my job is to um, my job is to pick. Uh, we have a what we call a BC Cup. And it's the top 160 players in the province, and they go to Salmon Arm every April. And that's under 16. That's a U16. So Do you have to be 16, or can it be if you're an amazing 15 year old? Can you be there? Or we, 14 year old? we talked about it last year with with an underage, but we're keeping it with one age for now. So so this year will be the 2005 boards. Yeah. And um, like I said, we go to Salmon Arm every April for what we call BC Cup. It's the top 160 players spread out through the province. So my job is to find the 160 throughout the province. So we do uh, regional evaluations. So if you are if you live in the north, uh, Kootenays, you go to a centralized trial in Prince George. Yeah. And my job is to go up there and find the best players that I think can make the 160. Do the same centralized trial in the lower mainland, Vancouver Island, and the Okanagan. So I go to all those different events, and I find the 160 that I think 
are at that level. We put them at uh, BC Cup, and you know all the Western Hockey League teams can come in and, and check them out. And uh, is that how we scouted? It's it's crazy because it's three two weeks before the WHL BAM draft, yeah. and it's the last chance for teams to get eyes on guys. And um, it's a nice final check mark for kids, and it's a it's a nice final um, progression. You get a chance to see the kids in September for the scouts. Yeah. September there's a big tournament. Um, November there's a big tournament. January there's a big tournament, and then April. So it's a nice um, gauge every three months. It's the final one before the draft. So it's a it's every Western Hockey League team brings their entire staff there. Mm-hmm. Just to, it's more of a cross check than anything. You know, you've been monitoring this kid all year. You've seen him, and um, you know, there's your last chance to to really you know form an opinion on the player. Right. Us on the BC hockey side, we're not worried about that. We're taking that 160. And we bring 60 to Shawnigan Lake for what we call a provincial camp. And then from there, we pick uh, a Team BC that competes um, in what we call a Western Branch Challenge. But, yeah, so my job is just, um, you know, ground floor, finding the 160, um, leading the evaluation staff to find the 60, and then leading the evaluation staff uh, at provincial camp. So I'm, I'm essentially the you know, evaluation lead. Sure. So. Is there any uh, secret sauce for any players out there, like, you know, 15-year-olds that – would, would like to make one of these camps or what the, however they, they can be, you know, they can be, because where do you get your information? Like if you can't go to every minor hockey league game, like you get phone calls or is there, is there guys in the area that'll let you know, Hey, take a look at these. Yeah. I, mean, I, I use, I use my knowledge from doing things like the brick or coaching spring hockey, where I see these kids, uh, you know, on a yearly basis. Obviously I can't be everywhere. I can't see everybody. Um, so you use people you trust for sure. Um, you know, I have a few Western Hockey League resources that I use. Um, one of my good friends is, is uh, you know, very connected in that league. So, you know, you can use resources. But I think the secret sauce is, like, you know, it's, it's going to sound so cliche, but just, like, be the player that, that you are. If, if, if you're, you know, if you're a goal scorer, then you have to score. If you're, if you're a, you know, if you consider yourself an energy forward that plays physical, you have to play physical because – I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can translate this into any kind of scouting we want. It doesn't matter if I'm watching you for under 16, WHL, BCHL, NHL. I might only be able to watch you, isolate you for five minutes or five of your shifts because I've got to watch multiple players. So those five shifts that I pick, they could be five of your worst or they could be five of your best. There's a lot of luck that, that's involved. Like, I'm, you know, I, I have to say that um, when, it's, when it's volume. You know, if, if I'm just watching one player, then chance of, you know, I, I get to watch all your shifts. But if it's volume and I got to watch 20 kids at once, you know, there is some luck involved. If I if I choose to watch you, you know, for this period and you have a stink period, then I'm going to go to somebody else the next period. So I think consistency is the biggest thing. And I don't know how to really, you know, ad- advise consistency because it's the hardest thing in life, at your job, at your, you know, whatever consistency is so key because like I said, if I pick my head up and I watch you for three shifts and, and they're your worst three shifts, how do I know that you had better shifts if those are the only three shifts that I watched? So. I think that's super invaluable for anyone there, you young guys. And, and I was to understand, I think it's just to understand it at that level, right? Because again, if you're a top, and that's why guys shift around so much between in the NHL level, which I know is because some guys will see guys, right? And they'll have a good night. Some guys will see them when they're having off nights and guys don't understand what, what other teams are seeing. You know, right. That's one aspect. The other aspect is you don't know when that person is there watching it. Right? You don't know, right? Um, and you might have had the hat trick the game before. Maybe that's why the guy's in the house the next night, but you're feeling good about that hat trick game and, you know, whatever, you're feeling pretty comfortable. Now you have a stinker. Right. And nobody knows what anyone's talking about, right? So yeah. that consistency of just knowing like that the preparation is key, I think, you know, and to get your body ready and to know that it's a grind. That's why, it's, I mean, again, show level, it's 82 games. Junior, it's 70. Uh, you go down, there's less games. But to be ready for those games, because that really can make a big difference in your career. It can impact things. Oh, it's crazy. And, like, I mean, I can think of times when I worked in the Western Hockey League or, you know, even in, even in Vernon that, you know, for example, um, you know, a, a, if, if I'm a player trying to get a scholarship, I'm 16, 17, 18 years old playing in BC Hockey League, and, you know, a school from, you know, New York flies out to see me play, um, I got one chance, man. And if I have if I have 10 shifts in a row where I'm not doing anything, that could be enough for that school to get turned off. The, the window is so, 
it's so short sometimes, you know what I mean? You don't have like, um, you know, sometimes you don't have the benefit of 20 games. You only have the benefit of 20 shifts and it's, it's, it's hard. Like, um, I can't stress enough that the, like the best scouts, um, you know, we have to watch multiple viewings because we can't just judge a player on, you know, one game, one shift, 10 shifts, but there are instances where volume depicts that, that scenario. So if I'm a, if I'm a school coming through the BCHL, I only have so many days, so many hours to watch. I pick that game to watch. If you don't play well, I'm probably not coming back the next night. That's how quickly the window can shut for some kids. So yeah, it's it's crazy. The, the margins are nuts, but yeah, consistency I think is the biggest thing. Well, and and again, I think that goes down. Like that's almost the final, right? I mean, if you're one of these top tier guys, right, that's on everybody's radar, you're gonna get a lot more looks. Of course, you have to get drafted. You get more chances. The first round, you get more chances in the second round. It's just the way it goes. Of course. But if you're so, if you're a guy right now and you're listening and you want to get drafted to the man draft, or if you want to get drafted to the NHL, or even you're in the minors, maybe you've already been drafted and you're trying to find your way. It's like you have to understand that your your opportunity window is a lot smaller. Yes. So you got to be more on point, and that's just the way it goes. And it's not being a victim. It's not being upset. It's just getting it right. right. That you got to be on. You got to be on because you don't know because there's so many guys in that seventh, eighth, ninth round hole. Yeah. Right. That you're fighting for spots with. That you got to show them. Yeah. Be more consistent. I mean, right? we, we know who the best players are. Like we can. I can sit here and talk about all the jobs I have or all the jobs I've had, and I can talk about how different they are but we all know who the best players are that's that's part of my job as, as a scout is is knowing who the top guys are so if i go watch a top player if i'm working for the under 16 level if i go watch a top bantam and he has an off night i'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt if i go watch a player who i have identified as being someone who needs to earn their way to our u16 event then they're not going to get the same chances as the top guy so i agree 100 percent with what you're saying and, and it's not it's not the kid's fault. It's just that's the way life is. If if you're a top player, you're you're allowed to make three mistakes. If you're an average player, you're not allowed to make any. And that's just you know, like you said, it's not unfair. It's it just that's the way it is. I think it's I think it's more um, you know the positives and the negatives. The, the good you know the best players have eight positives for every three negatives, whereas the the medium has four positives for every two negatives. So. Then, then the average player is probably too positive for every two negative. So that's why we hold the higher player or the better player to a you know to a standard where we allow him to make mistakes. That's right. what I'm or have an off night. Yeah. That that's what you know. If Connor McDavid's minus three, I have to believe the next night he has a chance of scoring a hat trick. You know, if the if a fourth liner's minus three, without disrespect to that player, you know he's not going to get the the same opportunity the next game. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, let's get into the Vipers because that's actually that's has been I mean a huge portion of, of, of uh, you know your career so far. Uh, you said Mark Ferner. Mark Ferner was head coach of the Vipers. It's a BCJHL team, uh, one of the top um, really leagues that, that delivers players to the to Division One schools down in the states. Uh, it's been that way for quite a long time, and uh, a lot of championship teams come out of that league. And the and the Vernon Vipers is is one of those perennial favorites. Um, and you know, back in the Mel List days when that ownership was there, they, they had some successful teams too. And then, and then, like you said, with the with Duncan Ray when he came in and, and, and brought Mark in, and they had some really good success. And you were part of that success. Um, Mark Ferner was somebody that I played with uh, for the Long Beach Ice Dogs. Yeah, I wasn't there for a long time. I definitely got traded from Toronto to LA, and they had me uh, in the IHL for a little bit. And it's funny because as many teams as I played for, like 14, 15, 16, I can't remember professional teams. Um, Mark was. Almost ten years my senior, which in in that in the hockey world is a lifetime, yes. right? I mean that's a that's an old dog, that's a veteran guy, yes. and uh, and he for whatever reason he he just took me under his wing a little bit. I mean I remember him taking me out for dinners. I remember him. I mean we both had, we were doing the chewing tobacco. He was a guy that chewed. I chewed. I mean I don't know. Like I thought that was cool with him, and we hung out. And he was just a really good guy to me. And the fact that he ended up coming to Vernon now, I still know him. And, Obviously, you know him in that regard. He was such an accomplished uh, head guy in, in that position, too. How did you build that relationship with Mark? It's, it's crazy. My cousin is a 95, and Mark's son is a 95. And uh, one day we were golfing, and we all ended up playing together. And, uh, you know, as hockey guys, there's not – I don't have much substance. I can talk hockey, and that's probably it. So Mark and I just started talking hockey. And, um, you know, by the end of the 18 holes, he asked me – you know, if I was interested in, 
I told them my passion for scouting. I had never had a scouting job before, but I was, I think I was coaching still at Brent Winter Club doing the Adam stuff. And uh, he had no reason to hire an Adam coach to, to, to scout a junior, you know, in junior A hockey. But I guess he thought I was a decent guy and he knew I was going to do it for free. And, you know, he, he could really, he could have told me at that time to go to the moon. I would have found a way to get there because I was so passionate about, you know, this is, this is the Vernon Vipers. Like this is, to me, it was the NHL and I treated it like that. So he gave me a jacket. I wore that thing. Like I, I wore that, like I won the Stanley cup and I did, um, I think I proved my value because I didn't, I didn't get paid. I was a volunteer scout, but I, but I, I went to games. Um, I interviewed kids. I sent him lists. I don't really think anything came out of it. Like um, there was a player in Vancouver actually who I know personally, Troy Stetcher plays on the Vancouver Canucks. And I remember sending his name to Mark and uh, we all know what happened with Troy now. I ended up in Penticton. Now he's in the, in the NHL. And that was like an email I still have on my computer because that's that's a cool memory for me. Yeah. Um, it shows me like at that time I was you know, astute enough to point out like a you know a player who, you know, I'm sure there was other people that pointed him out. But um, yeah, so Mark game I started. And the crazy thing is uh, I was sitting in a hotel room at the brick tournament one year, and I turn on my computer and Mark Ferner gets hired in Everett Silvertips WHL. So I thought like what am I going to do in Vernon now? Like my connection is gone. So the coach I took over was a guy by the name of Jason Williamson. And um, he honored me, same job. He said, you know, Kev, you come to camp, you do what, you know, you do what you were doing for Mark and we'll get the same relationship. So I really appreciated Jason doing that. And uh, three days into Vernon's camp, Mark called me from Everett and he goes, you know, would you want a job? And I, I, I thought he was joking because the Western Hockey League to me was, I never played that level. My friends did. I, th- I thought it was, I talked about Vernon being in the NHL. The WHL was unreachable for someone like me. I was coaching 10-year-olds. Like, yeah. WHL was unknown. Yeah. Um, in my early 20s, I'm thinking, like, there's no way. And uh, sure enough, Mark calls and says, you know, like, I told these guys how good you are. I told these guys you'll – you'll basically told them I'd do it for free because he knew I would. And uh, the GM at the time was a guy by the name of Doug Sotart. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> – Doug ended up giving me a, a job based on Mark's recommendation. So I'm sitting here talking about my scouting background or my scouting job right now in the NHL. There's a lot of people that help me along the way, but Mark, for sure, he got me in the Western Hockey League. And unfortunately, he lost his job two years in in Everett, but I was able to stay on as a scout. And then I was the first chance I had to come back with Mark here was, uh, yeah. So that, that was like, it's been the most full circle journey ever. And right. I'm so thankful for, for him giving me the opportunity. But, yeah, it was just no different no different than a player, um, a coach handing you, a, you know, a cookie saying, you know, you're, you're on the team, let's see what you do with it. And then same thing Mark did for me. He said, he said he didn't say, um, you know, he didn't say you're going to be successful. He just gave me a chance to do it. So and you were just trusted and you got to work with him. Because then now you've all been to the assistant coach position on the team, right? Yeah, he, um, yeah, like I said before, he called me in the summer and he just asked, you know, I want you to come here. And I remember at that time I had a little bit more experience. I had a little bit of leverage. Yeah. So I told him, I will come, but I want to be the head scout. I, I want you to, I want to be the head scout. And um, at the time there was already a head scout, but Mark, you know, moved some pieces around and I came here as the assistant coach and, and the head scout. So, he gave me full autonomy, full control of, you know, recruiting and, and all that stuff. And we were able to build some pretty special teams. You know, we had we had a team a couple of years ago that I thought would win. We had some injuries, but it was just a lot of fun being able to work together and, you know, like share the same uh, values, what we look for in players. And I thought we worked really well together. And now Mark's working for Buffalo Sabres. So, uh, yeah, we get to see each other on the on the grind. But, yeah, I, I owe that guy I owe that guy a lot. That's great. Um, when you say some, you had some success. I mean, how many, how many championships were you a part of? Um, I was just a scout for the first two, yeah. 2009, 2010. Yeah. Um, I didn't ask for a ring. I didn't want one because I wasn't a part of it. I was, yeah. just, I, I was just a young kid in Vancouver watching the finals on TV. I wasn't there. I wasn't a part of the team. But if I ever came through town, Mark was Mark would let me go on the ice with the guys and I got to know them. And one of the assistant coaches we had in Vernon, Kevin Krause was the captain. So I knew him as a player and then got to coach with them. You know, great, great person. So I wasn't I wasn't a part of it, but I but in my own mind I felt like I was a part of it. And uh, 
yeah, when we came back and I was coaching here, we lost in the interior finals a couple of times, but never won a championship together as a coach, but I was very thankful when they won in back to back successful that, teams, but you guys were always you guys were always relevant. You know what? It's uh, it's one of those programs, and you know, for people that are listening, if you've ever been to the Okanagan, it's a beautiful place. And if you're if you're a kid that wants to play junior hockey, there's there's very few places like this. You know, great fan base, great rank. You know, like Duncan, who's not here anymore. He's a great owner, great owner, and now John Glenn's the owner, and you know, putting money into the team and you know, success in the community and just good people. Yeah. But Mark used to always say, good teams have good people, great teams have great teammates, and that's where we tried to build from. And, you know, even if we didn't win every year, we felt like we had special kids that would go on to, you know, do good things in, in school. And hopefully we had a couple of kids get drafted a couple of years ago. So, right. you know, no, that's great. Just, I love that comment, too, because I just finished a book um, called Legacy, and it's about the uh, Museum of All Blacks. Yes. And, uh, and for all of you don't know, it's like, I mean, it's a hundred year program, essentially, that's, uh, you know, produced some of the world's best rugby um, out of this country of like four million people, right? And it's sort of like how, but there was a, a time where they where they started to fall off a little bit and they're trying to figure out and they have to rebuild their culture and their identity. And, and they s- decided that, uh, that what you almost said is that better, better people make better All Blacks. Right. So they stopped trying to find maybe the best, most talented, skilled guy because if they weren't a good person, it just wasn't something they wanted to have be part of their organization. Correct. Um, I believe in that 100%. I'm wondering you now from being on the scout side of the fence and then being in a locker room because um, you can see when a cancer is a cancer and how that affects guys. And like, how much do you incorporate that into how when you look for players, like the fact that they're good people? You know what? I never really thought about it until Mark really made it clear um as a coach in minor hockey you you don't have the dynamics that you do in junior the kids are only at the rink for you know an hour and a half their kids their dads are dropping them off like it's not um if you're a bad kid at age 11 and 12 you're sticking out like a sore thumb and i don't know if you're making it to junior hockey and i never really thought about it coaching minor hockey you're not in the dressing room a lot you're you know you're getting dressed as a coach you're getting dressed by yourself you're on the ice in practice you don't really know what's going on in the dressing room like whereas in junior hockey you're running video sessions you're running two hour long practices you're on the bus together you're you know in minor hockey you might take one trip in junior hockey you got a trip basically every week so the 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 i mean i'm not going to use the word cancer but the, the 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 kid who sticks out negatively he's more noticeable in junior because you're around them more frequently. I mean, you're spending five, six hours a day with everybody. So that kid sticks out like that. And that was the first time when Mark used to bring it up when it really flipped the switch. Like, you know what? He's right. Like, cause when you're coaching minor hockey, like I said, you don't, you're just, your best players win your games in minor hockey. That's just the reality of it. But in junior, your best player could be neutralized by a bad culture or a couple bad teammates. So that was the first time in junior I really thought about it. And now, um, you know, it's so important when we're, when we're looking at kids for the U16 level or when, you know, you're showing the NHL, if, if you're a bad person, I shouldn't say bad person, but if you have negative qualities, if you're selfish, if you're more interested in what you're doing than what your team, hockey's a team sport. You can't be individual based. Um, if, if, if there's any sort of negative vibe from you as a human being, then that's going to be enough of a red flag for, for any team. I'm not just speaking for Arizona. I'm speaking of for, for any team. Like, um, you know, if it's junior A, WHL, NHL, if, if there's any red flag for your character, that's enough to, to turn, 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 team team, sorry, turn teams off. Right. And I think for guys listening too, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that – a lot of those things are hard for a scout to see. Like you can see stuff on the ice, right? You can see how a guy maybe reacts after, you know, getting hauled down, maybe there's no penalty, or maybe, you know, the ref gives him a bad call, or he gets sad as shift. You can, you can see body language, you can see things um, yeah. as a scout, but what you can't see as a scout is what's happening in the room, right? Like right. when a guy shows up for practice, how he, how he handles the night off, you know I mean? These types of things, but um, the coaches do know that stuff. The coaches that are there in the room do know and they're the ones watching, and that's when we talk about these things called character. That's when we talk about these things called mental toughness, things like integrity. And when 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 teams are getting close, whether that's whether that's WHL level, whether that's a Viper level, whether that's even at the NHL level, people are picking up the phone and asking questions. Yeah. Right? What's this kid like? 
And that can be the make or break too, right? A lot of times because there are so many guys that have a lot of talent, yeah. right? Do you find that to be true? Like that those those phone calls get made? And sometimes 100%. Get and, I, um, and I have to do it. It's part of my job. I have to, you know, at the NHL level, we're investing potentially millions of dollars on you as a person. Um, you know, if there's any doubt in our minds, um, again, I'm speaking generally, I have to believe that all 31 teams act the same. Yeah. If there's any doubt in any of our minds that you're going to, you know, represent the organization negatively, it doesn't matter junior hockey or whatever, um, that's enough for us to lose interest. And I think, um, you know, kids have to understand it's easier said than done. You know, when you're growing up and your dad tells you or your mom says, you know, watch because people are always watching. Watch what you say, watch what you do, watch watch who you say, you know, about or watch who you talk to or watch how you talk to somebody. And it's so true because one one mistake could could hurt you for the rest of your life. You know, if, if you're, um, you know, if, if you do something negatively, you know, three, four years ago, you know, um, you talked about body language during the game. Um, there could be situations off the ice, you know, skipping curfew at your billet's house or, you know, um, I don't want to say alcohol and drugs because that's an extreme, but there is things like that. And you can never, re- it's tough to recover from that. And what you said about picking up the phone, that that's just doing your job. Like, um, you know, it's, it's easy for me to go in a rink and find the best player. That's not hard. Anybody can be a scout if we're trying to find Connor McDavid. Yeah. We know who he is. Yeah. My sister can tell me who Connor McDavid is. Yeah. But there is players that make the NHL by having the right character. And that that's our job to really, really dig and find those people. And like you said, you, you do have to make phone calls. You do have to do your research. You have to do your homework. And, um, you know, any, any good person that you've been around, you have no problem when somebody calls you to tell that person how great the other person is. And if you've been around negative people or people that you don't like, when somebody calls you, you have no problem telling everything, you know, th- you know, he did this, he did this, he did this. You're not a whistleblower. You're not ratting him out. You're just telling the truth. And um, I think from my sitting in this chair, knowing my job, I have to do that homework because I can't present a player to my boss and say, yeah, but, you know, he did this and also he did this. And by the way, his teammates, you know, said he does this. So that that's probably not going to fly. So. No, 100%. And, and that comes down to that whole relationship business that, that I was talking about when I'm talking with, with my players. It's like that coaching staff uh, – it's, it was, it was a, as I went through my career, it was a perspective shift, right? I, I At the start, it was like, oh, these coaches need to get to know me. Right. And then towards the end of my career, it's like, geez, I need to get to know them. Yeah. Because, like you said, like that, you're not on the other, other end of those uh, conversations, right? Right. And this isn't, I'm not saying this in a manipulative fashion, right? You're not right. going to manipulate a coach. You are who you are, but you can focus on what your strengths are as a player, right? right? And make sure people understand that. Make sure people understand that you care, right? right? If a kid comes up to you for the Vipers and says, hey, all I want is a Division One scholarship. I want to do. I want to know where I need to improve, and I want to spend some time with you before practice. You like that kid instantly. 100%. I know you do, right? Because not everyone does that, right? Now you know this kid cares. Now you know he wants to be better, right? Yeah. That's that's You're going to remember that. Somebody picks up the phone, this kid, this kid gives a shit. That's what you're going to remember, right? Yeah. So I just think, guys out there, you need to understand that these people, one, want to make you better, your coaching staff, too. And they're the ones that are going to provide you with opportunities, right? right? If you're a Connor McDavid, you don't need your coach to be in your corner, like you said. But if you're everybody else, you need that. Yeah. That's going to help you, you know? Um, which brings me to the point of we're talking about culture in rooms. Uh, and you said, you know, sometimes a, a, a negative environment sometimes may maybe bring down your best player, maybe it brings down others. How do you feel about – I just think that the, the, the captaincy, now it's a big it's a big uh, story right now in Toronto, who's going to be the captain. And, and – uh, Sometimes it's overplayed. I, I think I think it's only overplayed when you don't have a good one. Yeah. You know, and I think, like, to me, a guy that sticks out, and, and I don't know him personally, but I've heard the way he practices and the way he approaches the game, and a guy like Sidney Crosby. Like, when, you're, when your best player can also maybe be your best person, right, right your best example, right. like, what type of uh, follow-through, like, trickle-down does that have on everybody else, right? Whereas if your top guy is a 21-year-old superstar talent, Right, that kind of just gets by on his talent, and that's not who your leadership, uh, you know, icon is. Right. I think that's a very different message, right? How do you feel about that? I agree. There's a good quote that I try and tell young kids: "It's uh, how you do anything is how you do everything." So, right. if if you're up early in the morning and and you're prepared mentally for 
a video session or a pregame skate the same way you prepare for a game. That That is how you do anything, is how you do everything. If you prepare differently for morning skates and morning video than you do for the games, then you're not consistent. You're not preparing the same way. So um, if you ever have a captain, like you said, Crosby, I, mean, I don't know him personally either, but I can go by what I see in the media. I have to believe that if there's a practice at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., he's going to be on time, he's going to be prepared mentally, and he's going to be focused the same way he'd be focused for Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. And I think that that, that, that consistency in, in who you are as a person, that is what the, the strongest leaders have. They don't, they don't change their colors each day. They're just they're consistent. And, and again, I'm not going to speak to Connor McDavid because I don't know him as a person, but I can understand how um, you know somebody might think differently of him as a captain. But he might have unreal leadership qualities that, that we don't know about. I don't know him. I can't speak to this. But um, speaking to, to being around teams, and you've been around teams with, with great leaders, it's just the way they do everything. It's the way they pay attention in video. It's the way they pay attention in practice. It's the way they practice. And, you know, I have to believe McDavid isn't the best player on earth by accident. I have to believe he puts a time in. So he's probably an awesome captain, you know. Um, but there, there's very few people um, that just have that mentality, whether they're, um, you know, barbecuing a burger. They probably barbecue that burger like they're blocking a shot. They just yeah. had, like, some people are just wired differently. And I think when you find that special person, it sticks out so obvious. Like, in junior hockey, if you find a captain, we had a great one in Vernon, a local kid, Jagger Williamson, and he's like, you never had to tell him to do anything. That was the difference. You know, some other guys you had to massage, you know, get him up the rink on time. Um, you know, that was one of those guys, right? You just had to massage a little bit. But but Jags was there before anybody else, stays after everybody else, always on the ice. For, you know, like every day, I think, I think the best way I can put it is every day guy. You know what I mean? Every day, there's so much consistency with a good leader. And, and that's the stability that comes into a dressing room, right? There, there's, there's terms in hockey where we call players like heartbeats, where they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. Then there's flatliners who are just, you know, they might be boring. Like, you know, people want to say there's Jonathan Taves, uh, John Tavares, like, you know, Captain Serious. Yeah. But I, I like that. I enjoy that because there's consistency. You know, jo- Jonathan Taves on a Wednesday versus Jonathan Taves on a Sunday at the rink, I have to believe is the same. So that consistency can breed into the dressing room. And now all of a sudden everybody's looking around going, oh, okay. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's osmosis. If, if you're, if you're that consistent and you're dialed in for everything, then okay, maybe, you know, maybe it can rub off on me. So and I think that the self-awareness for guys to know that, I mean, even us sitting here talking, it, it's easy to stand out that way because even in this day and age, not everybody's like that. And we get the choice every time you wake up in the day, how you're going to be. Right. That's what I talk to my players about. You have the choice, right? If you actually want to be a hockey player, you have the choice how you're going to approach that day, how you're going to approach your practice, all those things. And, and you can easily stand apart from everyone in your in your locker room right? by being more professional, by being more consistent, by being more prepared. Um, so if that is your end goal, right, to whatever that end goal is, whether it's D1, whether it's, you know, WHL, whether it's NHL, there's a way to go about that that's going to make you get recognized, right? Yeah. And, and your skills are going to fall too, right? That's the other thing. Like this, this absolutely... Uh, directly correlates to being a better to being a better athlete. Yeah, and the kids that that I've been lucky enough to coach that play, the kids I mentioned earlier, you know, Barzell and Fabro, they at ten years old, eleven year olds, they had it. Like whatever it is, they had it. When yeah. they were at the rink at that age, it was not a fluke. Their their talent, you know, your talent gets you far. I get that. They they're both talented kids, but when they were eleven, twelve, thirteen they had the look in their eyes, like didn't matter if it was a skill session at six at night or if it was a skill session at six in the morning, their eyes told you everything you needed to know. The way they did the drills, the way they prepared for the practice, they were never late. You know, their, their water was, I get a kick out of kids that go on the ice with no water bottle. Like I know it means nothing to the kid, but I don't know any player I've coached that made it to the highest level that, that was like looking for, you know what I mean? Like, hey, my water's half full or my water's got water in it from two days ago. Like, I'm telling you, that's part of being a hockey player is having a backup stick, t- you know, just little things like that. And I can think back to vivid memories of Dante being 10 or 11 years old and just having the look in his eye. Like, it was 
there's no there's no other 11 year old like that so it's not a secret why those guys make it to that level right and it's not just those two players that's just the two that I can speak of sure. right but, do you think that's uh, interesting because that's something that I, I mean I'm coaching Adam now too and I've got into really what I'm doing so I'm coaching our top team in Adam right um, coached our, our C team in Adam which Hudson played for last year but both both years I, I said to the parents I'm like these kids are 9 and 10 years old I get they're young but we need to raise the standards for what they can handle, and, I'm like, and what I believe they can handle is their own equipment. Yes, and I believe they can they can pack their own equipment in the rink. Yes, they can hang their own equipment at home, and they can bring it in. They can have their sticks, and that was one of the things I said. Parents don't touch it. But I think in this day and age, like you said, like they're so coddled, right? Yes. They don't think about that stuff. And it is mom, mom's bringing a water bottle to the bench halfway yes. through practice because this kid didn't her kid didn't fill it up, and yes. that's where it's like for me as a parent, there is ways to help your kid. Be prepared, right, yes. and, and take it. Take his own dedication and commitment to it to another level. And that's just a small example. No, have your water bottle ready. Well, right? I, and what I said earlier about how you do anything is how you do everything. That's to me as a scout. You're always looking for cues, and if the cue is that the kid can't fill his water bottle, then that's enough for me. What else can he do? Right. If I tell him to, you know, floor check, is he get like if if I tell him to fill his water bottle and he can't do it? then he's just going to forecheck when I tell him to do it. Like, it, I'm not saying it's related, but it is. So like, it's, yeah. it, it's, you have, you have kids. If you tell them, you know, clean your room, uh, if you tell them, go shoot a hundred pucks, they'll do it. If you tell them to clean their room, if they don't, it's parallel. It's like, if you're willing to do this, you have to be willing to do this. It's, it's who you are as a person. So something as silly as like coming on the ice with your stick, not taped. Instead of playing 30 more minutes of video games, you could have taped it. Like, you, you could have. Like, there's nobody stopping you from taping your stick. Like, you know, maybe you had a late day at school and you had some circumstances where you couldn't. I get it. But I know young kids, like, we're being hard on them. But when I see a kid come on the ice with no water bottle, I'm like, what happened? Well, I, my mom, like, well, no, it's not, it's not your mom for God. It's you. That's part of being a hockey player. And the kids that I've been around that made it to the highest level – they're the ones that never, you never had to remind them of anything. It's the ownership aspect, right? Yeah. You think parents can help with that, right? All, you have to. Just like, you know, maturity, that. too, right? Yeah. Um, well, we've been rolling here. But I would like to maybe close with, I know there's a lot of guys that are maybe, even parents are trying to decide, I mean, what's the what's the best route for, for my kid, right? Is it is it the BCJ? Is it is it that path? Is it the WHL path? Um, I know I can only speak from, from my experience, like back when my draft year was 94. Yeah. Um, and I was a high prospect, right? So I was supposed to be a first, second round pick. Uh, and there wasn't many guys coming out of BCJ right away that were going to play in the NHL. Yeah. It just, it just wasn't that league, right? It was a league that you would go to, you would go to Div 1 and then, you know, maybe after a few years there, you'd come play in the NHL, whatever. So like the quickest route was, was, uh, was Western, was Western League from where we're from, CHL. Now I, I believe that's changed a little bit because there are some pretty high picks that are coming out of uh, coming out of the the BCJ and, and those types of leagues. So I believe that's shifted a little bit. But how do you like it? I I I would believe that every kid is a different kid and every situation is different. I understand that, but like, do you have any sort of advice as far as like what 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 to do or what to look for? I think the level can choose you at some point too. Um, you know, if you, if you're the best player. Um, and you want to play against the best competition, the Western League is the league for you. If you're physically mature enough to handle the 70 games and the grind of that league, um, it's the best It's the best junior league in the world. I'm not naive. I know that. And it produces the most talent every year. Um, if you're a player who's a, a late developer, maybe um, you know, you're not as physically mature as some other players, you're taking your time developing, you're not, the, you're not at the top of the pyramid at 14, 15, 16, then take your time and, and think about the long runway. You know, that's the that's the old phrase that we use, just the long runway. You know, the Western League, um, you're betting on yourself in the Western League. And and those kids that bet on themselves, uh, they end up making it. You know, like the, the top guys in the NHL, a lot of them were from Major Junior. You know, John Tavares played Major Junior. Mitch Marner played Major Junior. You know, we talked about Matt Barzell. He played Major Junior. Um but you look at a guy like Alex Kerfoot, he, he played BCHL, Oklahoma Express, he went to Harvard. He took his time to get to the NHL. He took his time to develop. I think Alex would be the first to admit he wasn't the strongest 14, 15, 16-year-old. He needed that extra couple of years to develop. Um, you know, in college and BC Hockey League gives you 
a couple more years uh, of that runway. So I think we're seeing uh, NHL teams um, sort of be attracted to that, you know, hey, here's a kid that might not be at his peak yet, but if we if we look at him for what he is right now, let's look at him for what he can be in three, four years. And I think the, the BCHL college route uh, gives you just maybe a little bit more time, right? A little bit more time to marinate and a little bit more time to develop physically. And you never know. The, the chance of playing in NHL is so small, regardless if you're playing major junior or not. So I think the attraction for the college for us is, you know, um, in junior especially is, you know, maybe you get another couple of years to develop and mature physically. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any, I can't say there's any answer, um, you know, do this, do that. I just think you'll know physically. I think that's the biggest thing. If you feel like you need more time um, or if the other thing that people don't understand is education might be a passion for some kids. You know, like we had some kids coming through Vernon that, that wanted to go to school. So school is an attraction for them. Um, you know, to the families and the parents. Oh, it's, that. it's like you look at you know some of these schools. It's three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar worth of scholarship just by being a good athlete. So you know you leave school with a with a degree. There was there was two players in Penticton recently, Tyson Jones and Dante Fabro, that went the school route. Ultimately, they left school before they graduated. But I think they'll tell you that um, you know it was a college hockey is very relatable to pro. It's, it's older players, it's, it's stronger players, because the average age in college, you can be over the age of 20. Yeah. Whereas in junior, you know, you're under the age of 20. So in college, you're seeing a lot of these college free agent guys, they, they play in the National Hockey League because it's very parallel, playing against older competition. So I think Tyson and Dante will tell you that that competition helped them you know, get to the NHL. But I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think that it's it's so black and white. Every kid's going to be different. But I just think if, if you, the more educated you are in both leagues, the, the better decision that you can make for sure. I agree. The one, uh, one that stands out for me is I played as a 15-year-old in the BCJ. So I played for Penticton. And I remember for me personally at that time, like my draft year would have been like my third year in the right. BCJ. Right. Um, and I still would have had to have another year before I could go gone to college. Right. So I would have had four years in the BCJ starting at 15. And even that for me was like, that's just too long. Right. I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't even get that through my head at the time. Right. I was good in school. I like school. All that stuff was fine. But I was like, I just, I don't think I can do it. And I want to be an NHL. Like that was it. Right. And I was like, okay, this is going to be the best path. But which was interesting for me is on that same team was Paul Korea. So now here's a guy that was small, like you said, but he was amazingly gifted. He's a Hall of Famer, right? So, like, there would have been a WHL team that he could have played for, but he chose to go BCJ, right? He chose that he was going to go the university route, and obviously that never hurt him. Um, Those are the decisions that I think are interesting. Sometimes you say, I don't know Alex Kerfoot, but I know some guys, they're kind of, they're maybe not highly recruited guys for the Western League, so they become the guy in junior and that just seems to be a more a, a more better fit you know, to make that choice it's it's totally a fair point and opportunity is everything in life regardless of sport or anything opportunity is you know you could if you like what i said earlier about pat quinn saying match the level you're at before you go to the next level i think that that example applies exactly with kerfoot he played two years in midget but he dominated midget so after dominating his level, he went to the next level. He didn't jump two levels. Yeah. He didn't go, okay, I'm going from midget to the Western League. I'm going from midget to junior A. Yeah. He dominated junior A. Then he thought, okay, well, I'll go to the next level. He went to Harvard. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. As a senior at Harvard, he was a dominant player. Yeah. Boom, in the NHL. So he, he climbed the ladder the way that you know worked for him. Sometimes these guys, they'll, they'll dominate midget, and then they'll jump in the Western League and not might have that success. So what you talked about with Korea, like he, he dominated leagues until he made the National Hockey League. So I think it's it's all about opportunity. You jump in the Western League and now you're on the third, fourth line. In the BC Hockey League, you'd probably be a first, second line player. So I think match the level that you're at before, you, before you're ready for the next level. That's 100%. My own little sticking point, I still think that's crazy that you can't put the other way to and then get a, get a scholarship. I think that's something that has to change. I yeah, I, I've seen it hurt kids where they play, um, you know, I'm not going to say they got bad advice, but it's hard to be a, it's hard to be a 15-year-old kid and the Kelowna Rockets comes at you and says, you know, hey, sign this piece of paper, let's get you into some games. Like, I'm not silly. The atmosphere at a WHL game 
the quality of play is superior to that of a BC Hockey League game. You know, we we would get X amount of fans. You can triple that going to a WHL game. It's it's the real deal. You yeah. know, and, and you're playing against. I mean, last night I watched a game. Dylan Cousins played in it. I mean, he was just a top top pick to Buffalo. So you're playing a league with top NHL talent. So it is an attraction. So I don't blame a 15 year old kid for signing that piece of paper wanting to play. But I have an issue if he plays one game, he can't go back and uh, get that retracted. So I would like to see something change. I mean, I don't know what the number would be, 20 games, 50 games, 100 games. But um, I think the kids that make – I don't want to call it mistakes because we all make mistakes. I just think that, you know, there there would be benefits from the NCAA saying, you know, we we think that you made an end – uneducated decision sure. doing this and you know we'll revisit it whether there's a suspension or whatever yeah. but I think kids are you know we're driven by if, if there's 5,000 people in the stands boom I'm signing that thing I'm playing but if that's only get my play then I shouldn't have to face the repercussions well I agree and I just say to everybody when I'm talking to parents now it's uh, that's a really hard decision for a 15 year old to make right and and it's and it's was the 15 year old my parents were, were nice and I mean, supportive with me but it was they let it be my decision right sometimes uh, family units aren't aren't done that way and the mom and dad are making the decision but regardless of who's making that decision you don't know necessarily what that 15 year old is going to be like at 17 18 right like so many things happen in that window too so I just yeah my feeling of the NCAA is like treating this as a professional league is, is not accurate. These are kids trying to do the best that they can. Right. And if somebody does make you know as you say you know a mistake, uh, an uneducated choice, I don't think they should be punished in that scenario. If they can be a good diff one player, let them be a diff one player. And I, and I think like the the last thing I'll say is that the, the Western Hockey League, I mean they have their amount of players that they can sign is. You know, I think it's – there's 50 on a protected list. So, I mean, obviously, there's only 20 that can play in the game. So if I sign and, you know, two months later I get passed by six or seven kids, all that I've done is just signed. I haven't done anything. I haven't played. I haven't established myself. So right. I think the, the biggest mistake that, that people can make is signing – and then with no guarantee of – you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if you're just signing – to sign so you can put it on Twitter, you know, hey, I signed, then, you know, I'm not going to be the first one to fight for you to get NCAA, you right. know, I if that's your motivation, then that's your motivation, but the kids that, that play in that league and have success take their time. We talked about Matt Barzell a hundred times today, but he waited a full year to sign the Western Hockey League. He didn't, he got drafted um, in May with, with his draft. He didn't sign until the following draft in May, so he took a year. And, you know, we all know that it worked out for him. Yeah. But I'm, I was proud of him for taking a year yeah. to, to make an educated decision. Yeah. Be diligent. Right? Yeah, and some, time, some right? kids, you know, they get drafted. It's the sex appeal of the league. I'm not stupid. It's it's an unbelievable league. Yeah. And if you go to a, you know, a Colonial Rockets game on a Friday night, it's it's a great atmosphere. So I'm not silly to think that kids don't want to play there. Yeah. It's just, you know, you can, you can put yourself in a corner. So. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, you want to pick what's right for you. You want to be in this in an environment where you can where you can succeed. Like yeah. I said, to your point of like mastering that level, do you want to be a 16, 17 year old kid on the fourth line? Is that necessarily helping you? Right. Sometimes, and there's stories where that does help guys. Right, it teaches you, know, you that mental toughness and that adversity to be a part of a team and to fight through stuff. Um, so it's not like there is one way, but. Uh, you know, it is nice to be in an area where you're getting the trust from the coach. You know, you're playing 20 minutes a night. Uh, you're developing in that aspect right in game time. And and you will get found. That's yeah. the other thing I always say to kids, right? Like, you will get found. If, if you if you play the right way and if you put up the points and you make the right leaderships, you're going to get found. Yeah, I mean, at some point or another. So it's not that you have to be under the bright lights of WHL. You don't have to be... You know, in uh, we mentioned the Rockets. You know, what I mean, make the plan for the Rockets at, at 16, 17 for you to make it. There's a lot of stories where that doesn't happen. So just do do what's right for you yeah, and for your family. I think some kids, though, too. Like the last thing I'll say is, I think some kids um, they're not motivated by school, and that's what leads them to the Western League, and that's fine too. Like yeah. I've tried to recruit players to Vernon that told me straight up, like I don't want to go to university, and I respect that. So if I see that player sign. At least he was honest with me, right? School's not for everybody. Like, there's kids that go to full NCAA scholarship as athletes, and 
they ended up coming back to the Western League because they didn't realize the commitment that it took between studies and athletics. So it's, it's not it's not as simple as going to University of North Dakota and taking you know like pottery. It's you're still a student, yeah. you know. So I think that um, yeah, I think that you really have to be motivated to go down that path. Right. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Well, that's cool. We're about an hour and fifteen in. So um, I guess at the end, two of my keywords are are. Uh, Character and mental toughness, and I think those are two kind of intangibles that everyone, and probably yourself included, has a little different definition of what those things are. Um, I know character, for me, I always thought of it as being something that was, you know, would I go into the corner first, or would I, would I play injured, would I stick up for a teammate, like those types of things I, I identified with being a good hockey player, and, and, I, and I felt I did a good job of living up to those things, but I didn't necessarily think about character off the ice, right? Uh, not saying, you know, I was a good, bad kid or whatever, but there was something that I just never associated with, with being a character guy. Yeah. Um, and same with mental toughness. What does that actually mean? So those are the two, the, the, the two definitions of, uh, of mental toughness. Well, what do you think a mentally tough player is and what do you think a guy with character is? Um, one thing I'll say about character is to have character, not be a character. That's what I try and tell people. So character is, for me, divided into two uh, avenues. One, off-ice character. So, you know, good in the community, good with good in the room, good with the staff, you know, like how do you treat the trainers? We all know the trainers and athletic therapists are the hardest working, you know, element on any team. You play in the NHL, those guys lug your bag around, they pack your stuff, they bring on the road. Those are the guys, your true character is always revealed when stuff's not going your way, right? And that's what character means to me. Everybody has the best character when the team's 20 and 0 and they've got three hat tricks in a row, then everybody's character is like, oh, this guy's the greatest guy in the world. But if you're on a 10 game losing streak and you haven't scored in a month, now your true character is going to be revealed. Do you start pointing fingers? Do you start, you know, getting down on teammates? So I think character to me in hockey is how you treat the the staff and how you treat your teammates and how you treat, um, you know, the game when it's not going well. Right. Then there's character off the ice, how you are in the community, how you are with your friends and your family, and and all those things will get back to us as scouts. Now, mental toughness for me is um, about adversity. So mentally tough people can handle adversity better than mentally weak people. And I'm not going to sit here and say there's 8 billion people in the world. We're not all built the same. I'm not as mentally tough as other people, and I'm sure... People listening will say, you know what, I'm not as mentally tough as, as them either. Yeah. But I think mental toughness is just the strength in yourself to deal with adversity. When stuff isn't going your way, when a coach says, hey, you're healthy scratch tonight, that's an, that's an um, th- that's a for you to have that's you know something for you to show your mental toughness, right? right? If 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 you get if you're on the power play, you get taken off the power play. That's something now for you to show your mental toughness. And I think. Um, the players that you see, what we see on TV, they are mentally tough. You don't make that level by by being mentally weak. And, and being mentally weak is not an illness. It's just, um, you know, you, you can doubt yourself a little bit more. You can even get down on yourself. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of great outlets. Um, I've been to counseling myself, you know, gone through some personal stuff. I'm not the most mentally tough person on earth, but I think it's something you can train yourself to be. Cool. Cool. I'm just going to ask you that question. Yeah, I think both of those, which which uh, might be a perspective shift for some people listening, is I believe character and mental toughness are both things that you can develop and change and grow. I agree. Um, there's some people that stand aside and say, you know, you are what you are, and that's just what it is. I don't think so, because I think every day you have an opportunity to, to do something different with your choices and with how you're handling stuff. And even with the mental toughness aspect, if you didn't handle something maybe the way you wanted it to, if you, if you can have the self-awareness uh, and the approach to be like, okay, how can I handle this differently next time? And how do I support myself to be able to, to make a better decision in a certain scenario? Um, if we have that, that mindset, that growth mindset approach to these, to these types of things, I think we become better players. Yeah. Guys want to become better players. If you, can be, if you can grow your character and if you can grow your mental toughness, you're going to be a, you're going to be a better hockey player. I think again, a lot of it's maturity, too. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that at a young age. I was pretty mature. I never... I never thought about being a better person because I was I was immature. I never thought about myself in that light. And then you know, go you you go through some personal stuff. We all do. Yeah. And like, I'm not going to judge anybody, but I I'll be the first to admit I I've, I've been to counseling because I wanted to be 
Um, you know, I didn't want to feel sorry for myself anymore. I didn't want to feel like I couldn't get through what I was going through. I wanted to, I wanted to develop strength in myself to believe I could, could do it. So I'm, I'm walking, living proof that you can change your mental aptitude or your mental toughness. Yeah. And it just takes time, but you can. And, and it's, it's little things like, um, you know, instead of five negative thoughts for every one positive thought, it's just maybe three to one ratio. And then all of a sudden it becomes two, two to two. And, uh, you know, I, I get it, right? It's hard to remind ourselves uh, positive thoughts every day, but I agree with you 100%. If, if you're um, the same way we can go to the gym and get strong, we can train our brains to get strong as well. And I and I believe that 100%. And I think that's um, something that, that – athletes and people that aren't even in sport can can train their, their brains to do so it's uh it, our brains are very powerful and they can work negatively and positively it's just trying to get you know the, the positive mindset i uh it's interesting because sometimes people think like that you need to be you need to classify yourself as mentally weak or maybe that's one of your deficiencies for you to work on that um for me personally i i never even understood that i could have maybe worked on it more until I had like a scenario, an environment where it was just too much for me, right? Like growing up, like, there was a ton of adversity I had uh, with the, the WHL, like Brian Maxwell, we had a scenario with the coaching scenario there in my draft year when all that stuff was going on where I was having a hard time getting played and there was all this trade controversy and like for a 16, 17 year old kid, that, that was a lot, you know, yeah. but I handled that well, I thought, like I persevered, went, fought through that, there's other things um, that happened, but the one time when I got traded from uh, Florida to Toronto, and I walk into that dressing room and having to deal with that, like I didn't even know that I needed more mental toughness to handle that situation. Right. So I guess what my takeaway is from that is, is like even if you do identify as being mentally tough or you right. identify as having like these character traits, like we can continue to work on that as well to be prepared for what we don't even know yet. Right. You know, because um, there's always going to be something. There's always going to be something that might surprise you, right? And if you're not thinking about it ahead of time, you're just going to be at the whim of the situation. That's where I felt myself. So I just think. Those guys, you're right. NHL guys, however they dealt with it, they've gotten there, they've gotten through stuff, tough stuff, and uh, and it's worked for them. So yeah. I'm sure there's not one guy in the NHL going, geez, pretty mentally weak, you know, but I, I guarantee you there's stuff that they could be doing that can make themselves even stronger. Right? And, so, and in junior, the, the struggles are a lot different than they are in the NHL, right? You, yeah. You've got to balance school. You've got to balance your time. You're you know, away from home. You're away from home. With no friends that you don't know about. You're going to a new community. Like you could be, we had kids on the team from Boston, New York City, Philadelphia. So you're hours away from, you know, your girlfriend, your mom and dad, your sister, your brother. And the thing is, you, you never know what somebody's going through. That's the crazy thing about life. Like, you know, sitting in this chair, like people listening don't know what I've been through. I'm not about to get into it. But when you're coaching kids or when you see them on TV, you don't know. You don't know. You know, this guy hasn't scored in 10 games. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So I think it's easy for us as fans, you know, to point fingers at our favorite players and what the heck, you're not scoring. But there's a lot of things that go on to it. And I think that if everybody's just – self-awareness is huge. But if everybody's um, – you know, I think if – yeah, there's a stigma going around that, like, you know, mentally weak is, is an illness. But it's not. It's just, you know, I mean, it's we are who we are. And if you have a, if you have an issue with how you're feeling, I just think, like, you know, if you need to get help, and get help. But I think it's something that you can definitely train your brain for sure. How do you feel? I think that's a good one to close on is just the support factor. Um, and support factor, but I mean, yeah, whether you're a junior kid, right, going through all the stuff that we just said, right, you're 16, 17 years old, you're dealing with the social anxieties of, of being a high school kid, probably one of the most awkward times of your life. Now you're in a new, but sometimes a new country like I was, right? New high school, new friends, trying to fit in with teammates, trying to impress coaches and scouts and be the best hockey uh, hockey player you can be. So there's all these things that are going on. Um, and sometimes we do it alone. Yeah. I, mean, I was one of those guys that was like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to figure this out, right? We don't talk about it with, uh, with our teammates, even in the locker room. We don't necessarily have a support cast outside other than our parents, and our parents don't really get what we're doing either. Right. Um, like, I think, I think personally, I think a good coaching staff is really, a, it, it can really help in that scenario. And I also think somebody outside of that, like some to align with people that get it and care about you can really help. Yeah, I think that's what made me a good assistant coach from, from Mark was I could talk to the kids about that stuff if they ever, if they ever needed it. Yeah. Um, I just think, if if you want advice as a player playing junior hockey, go if if it's that bad. Like, 
I'm, I'm speaking from someone who went to counseling. I went and got professional help, and it wasn't because I was weak. It wasn't because I was ill. It was because that was the person I was most comfortable talking with. So yeah. if you're ever in a bad space mentally playing hockey or doing anything in life, seek out the professionals because that's their jobs. And, and if you have a great coaching staff, then use them as resources. You know what I mean? It's, it's uncomfortable to talk about sometimes with your family or your friends. So, you know, go tell your coach what's bugging you. And, and that's what being a good coach is all about. That's what separates the good coaches from the great coaches is having that relationship with their players. And if, if you have an open door policy in junior hockey and, and an 18 year old kid walks in and says, Hey, you know, my, my parents are going through a divorce and having a tough time figuring this out. A good coach will listen to that player. You know, uh, I'm not going to say a bad coach, but the alternative is just slamming the door on that kid and, and you might lose them. Um, you know, he doesn't play well for 20 games and then you end up trading him. Where the alternative was, had you just listened to his story, you might have gotten him to come around. So it's, just, factor, it's a thousand percent. And if, and if you're a player who's listening that says, you know, what, I don't plan it. I'm, I'm scared of my coach. I'm intimidated. I was intimidated to tell people for the longest time. So what I did was I just went and got professional help with someone who wasn't going to judge me. And someone who was, you know, it's it, everything that you say to that person is 100%. You know, between between you and him, so um, or or her. So I think if you ever get in a situation where you need to talk, make sure you're talking to someone who who you trust, and make sure you can you know get the help that you need. Because ultimately, our brain is so powerful, positive and negative. It's it's you're a way better person when you're when you're working positively than negative. And it's good to have that support person again. Like I I, I try and frame it in the in the idea that you don't have to be down at the time that you're looking for this. Like, if you want to be proactive about your scenario, like, build your team, right? Yeah. Build your team. Like you said, everyone has good character when the times are good, right? When the times are good, you should be, you should have good people around you. So when the time do, does come where maybe something goes wrong, that you still have that support factor there. And again, my story with Toronto, like, I legitimately had no one to talk to. Like, if my agent wasn't around, my mom and dad didn't get it, uh, there was no one in my support system that I could be like, hey, like, how the hell do I handle this? Like, yeah. what, what do I do tomorrow? Yeah. Right? Like, how do I how do I navigate this scenario? And I'm not telling anyone out there. I don't know who that person is for you. Like, but there is people that exist, whether it's third party, whether it's professional, whether it's whatever. But you need to have it because you don't even know when it's coming. Right? You don't know when it's coming. You're going to need that support. And you might not be down right now, but you're going to be something that's going to happen to you. You want to be a professional hockey player. You're going to need somebody to talk to. And uh, you build your team, and I think you build it wisely because uh, it's uh, your inner circle is important, and you don't feel like you have to do it on your own. That's yeah, my big thing. When I coach these young guys, I know we spoke about the brick and you know new sixteen and stuff. When I meet these young guys, I always offer, "Here's my number if you ever need anything." And that's what I want to be. Yeah. I don't, I don't just want to be a, a scout. I want to be a scout, but I also want to be a good person that's able to help these kids. So yeah. if one of these kids is struggling in junior, you know, for example, one of the kids on on Vernon. Last night, called me in the airport. I, I recruited him to Vernon. He called me and just, you know, talked to me for 15 minutes about, um, you know, some of the struggles he felt for the first seven games of the year. He felt like, you know, I, I didn't have some points. You know, I'm feeling down on myself, you know. And I, he's 16, 17 years old, and he can call me whenever he wants because that's what I want to be. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I didn't have that support when I was growing up. Obviously, we have our families. And, but sometimes you can't talk to your families about this stuff. So I always offer my help for any kid. If you're, doesn't matter how old you are, or your parents can call me, or if you're in the NHL, if, if I've coached you in the past, like my phone's always on. So if you ever, hey, I'm going through a slump, you know, can you can we just talk about the game? Like that, that's what I want to be. I don't want to. I want to be able to impact people's lives off the ice. So that's what I always, as a coach, that's what I always want to do. So. Oh, that's great. And again, for the young guys, and I just read an article of um, getting Malcolm Gino, Gino yeah. Malcolm last year. It was his worst year uh, in, in the NHL, one of the best players of our time. Um, and he was talking about all the mental stuff that he was going through and how he isolated himself and how he wouldn't talk to his wife and how he was getting mad at his teammates and all these scenarios that happened. This is like Malcolm, right? Know. You know what I mean? Like, all the same point. Yeah, so don't think that you know, you're 15, 16, 17, and maybe you're having some doubts, confidence doubts. You're going through these things that it, it means that you're not wired right to be a hockey player, right? That just makes you human. That's right. all that is, right? right. And, uh, and don't think you have to do it by yourself. Just uh, utilize your coaches. Utilize, find a teammate in that room that you can talk to. You know, find somebody outside. Build your little core group there, and uh, that's going to make you stronger. Yeah. 
So I think that should wrap it up. I really appreciate you coming today. Yeah, Kevin, no you had a good time? Yeah, it was great. That yeah. was perfect. So hopefully everyone got a little bit of value out of this today. And um, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, bud. Awesome. Yeah. Just watch me.